we were in a down cycle at the time. I did a cash out refinance and I used that cash to pay off some other properties. So I got that one and a few other ones at those low interest rates, somewhere in the threes, long-term fixed, and then took some extra cash in that equity and paid off some other properties to get those free and clear. And I saw that loan as a promise that I wanted to fulfill. And in the long run, it sure does open things up and it does become easier as you go. Welcome to the podcast, Real Estate Investing with Coach Carson. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach Carson, and this is a show to help you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. In today's episode, I'm really excited to have a friend of mine, a longtime investor named Anthony Petz. Anthony lives in Bellingham, Washington. He's been investing for, he he and I were talking ahead of time, kind of joking about it, almost 20 years. So he's almost a a two-decade veteran in the real estate investing space. And we're going to talk today about his journey and also about seller financing. This is a topic that I know a lot of you have been thinking about as interest rates have gone up. And how do you kind of pull out the old financing toolbox and use other ways to do deals that might not cash flow, that might not work by using creative financing and specifically a tool called seller financing. And both Anthony and I have used, uh, have done a lot of deals over the years with seller financing. And so we're going to get into that as well. But first and foremost, I want to say hello to Anthony. Anthony, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. All right, Chad. Good to be here. Thanks, bud. I appreciate it. So I want to start with your story and just some kind of stats. Like we were turning over the baseball card of uh, of Anthony Pets here. You you know where you are now. You have about twenty five units. You've been investing 18, 19 years. You're in Bellingham, Washington. I featured you in the book. So if people have read the book, The Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor, Anthony kind of took when I had a whole section of the, of the third of chapter three on the entrepreneurial path to financial independence and how you know some of us just kind of jump out of the airplane with a little parachute and just try to be an entrepreneur early in our career. And that's what Anthony did. I did the same thing. And so I'd love to go back to that, Anthony, kind of those early days when you and I first met, you were working in kind of more of a corporate job, but you had this interest in real estate investing. So I'm just curious if you, I know a lot of people have been there and maybe are still there. So can you talk a little bit about that part of your journey and how it all got started? Uh, You know, even going into that, that uh, more corporate job, it, it, the end goal was always to be uh, doing something on my own. And I wasn't real clear on what that would be. <clears throat> but then I, I guess the more I was researching what that might be, even prior to uh, getting into real estate, it's just real estate kept coming up as something that seemed like it would be a good fit for me as far as, um, uh, I guess, just interest, but also becoming more clear on what my goals were. And a lot of that, uh, I mean, really like my, my, my goal was financial independence and real estate just seemed to be, it just seemed to kind of ring true as, as where I wanted to go, the direction I wanted to go to, to achieve that. And so as I was working in that job, it was a sales position, outside sales sales position. And so it was, it worked well because I had a lot of flexibility. I was able to take phone calls or or maybe sneak in an appointment here and there throughout the day to go see a seller or something like that. Um, So that's what I started doing is I started, uh, you know, on the side after hours mostly, but, you know, I was able to, like I said, sneak in those calls or appointments here and there during the day if I had to, but I was doing a lot of it really on the side at nights, mornings. I was actually getting up really early every morning, writing letters, uh, listening to educational material to get up on things. And I was doing the same thing after work, uh, a lot of driving. So I was listening to everything I could to try and learn. And, and that's, that's how it started. It was really a lot of learning and going to meetings, joining the local real estate investors club. And, um, and I guess that's, that's kind of how it started and, and, you know, began to take off. And I remember, so you did a written interview for me on my blog, which I'm going to put a link to so everybody can check out to kind of get all the details of this. But there was one moment in your early journey that really stood out to me where you basically said you almost quit or you almost gave up because it was really a difficult grind. Like you were doing tons and tons of this effort and getting very little results. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I I was putting in a lot of time, you know, I was, uh, my job you know, I was probably working, uh, you know, nine, probably nine hour days. Uh, and then I was just 
putting so much more time into real estate on top of that. And I had been for, I don't remember now, but it was probably a few years at whether it be education, um, you know, as time and money or the actual uh, activities related to investing and trying to become, you know, a, a viable real estate investor and, and do that for myself and, and my family. Uh, and after a few years, you know, it gets demoralizing when you haven't really experienced the success that you want. You have these goals and, you know, you're working every day. And I was very, very um, focused on those goals. And it, it had become a dream, you know. And at some point, though, you you hit enough bumps in the road. You start wondering, OK, like, it, is it me? Am I not cut out for this? Is it the area I'm in? Is it not the right place to be for this? You know, you think of all the all the reasons why you're not succeeding. <clears throat> and that's a good thing. You know, you, you have to think of why you're not succeeding so you can figure out how to fix it. But I reached a point where it was like, OK, um, if I can't turn this around in the next six months, then I'm going to have to really reevaluate this and, and, you know, possibly just move on. Uh, and so that's what I did. And, and fortunately, I was able to. Uh, get things going. And around 2009, I started experiencing some success and then definite snowball effect. And I, I don't know what that was. If it was, I, I think what it was, was just the culmination, a kind of uh, a convergence or confluence of uh, timing with the market, I think had something to do with it. it. It was good timing, but then also just all the work I'd been doing prior to that turned out to be more of um learning than it was actual, you know, earning. And I think that was a great thing because, uh, you know, that it, it was, it was, it was trial, trial by error, or tri trial and error, trial by fire, where it was just all these things I was doing was just, uh, it was just me getting my real estate, um, investing masters more or less, you know, it was like a second degree I was getting. It was like, I was going back to college to become an investor. And that's, that's more so what I got out of that period where, uh, you know, I thought I was reaching the end of my rope and turned out I was just preparing for, you know, the successes that were to come. Yeah. And not only the knowledge you learned, I mean, so you had a ton of, ton of knowledge and learning and just trial, but you also tested your will. I mean, are you, are you going to yeah. stick with, stick with us or not? Because man, I, I don't know about you, Anthony, but being an entrepreneur is hard. It's not like it's a cakewalk. There's all sorts of uncertainty and ambiguity and like, is this going to work and self-confidence issues every day? Like if anybody says they're always like confident, I, I know they're not telling the truth but because <laughs> this, this thing is, this, this thing can be hard. So I'm glad you're acknowledging that because I think people listening also have had either they're in it right now or they've hit their own spots where man is frustrating. There's so much competition. I can't get a deal. I've been making offers. Yeah. So I know for you, I remember if I remember right, you know, you were making a lot of offers. You were trying, you were doing some of the things you had learned to do. You just weren't getting any results. And mm -hmm. yeah, somebody was out of your control. Like you were, you're in a, in Bellingham and, and North in the Washington state, pretty competitive market, rising market. There's tended to be a lot of appreciation. So when it came back down in 2009, many more opportunities. And so you, so if I remember right, you had, you and your wife bought a duplex early in your career and did like a house hack. Is that, so that was one deal you did. You also had a single family house. So in those early days, you had a couple of rentals. Once you started kind of getting from that starter phase, like early on to this builder phase where in 2009, you finally started kind of getting some more progress. What, what did deals look like for you then? Were you looking to flip houses? Were you looking for rentals? Were you looking for both? I'm just curious what, as you started transitioning, what that business looked like for you? Yeah. I mean, I was eager with a lot of, a lot of time and um, energy to put towards it. So I was really open to anything, you know, I've been uh, learning everything and I, and I needed I mean, ultimately what I wanted was passive income. So, and that to me was going to come in the form of rentals at that point in time, but I needed money too, or at least I wanted to have money. I felt, figured that would help with the, uh, the other side of it. So I was open to anything. I was doing some wholesaling <clears throat> at the time. Um, at that point I hadn't, hadn't had any successful flips. Those did come later. Uh, not a lot of them, but some, um, so yeah, so that, that was my focus is I was just looking for any way to kind of leverage my knowledge and time, uh, in marketing. Uh, if I found a deal, I wanted to find a way to, or figure out a way to monetize it really, or, or, or at least capitalize on that deal in some way, shape or form. 
Yeah. So flips, flips for short-term income, rental properties for kind of that periodic cash flow and the long-term growth. So you're doing you're doing both yeah. of those. Yeah. At that time, it was more more like the the wholesaling than the flipping. Um, I've probably I've done a small handful of the the flips, but uh, yeah, at that time to start out it was wholesaling. I did a fair bit of. I did some assignments. Um, and yeah, in the first two, you know, the first one was actually a condo that we lived in for a while, moved out of. And then the second one was a duplex that we rented half out of half of it out and lived in the other half. And and I kind of saw those as just slow boat to China deals. You know, I, I did those two and I'm like, all right, this isn't this is not getting me where I need to go. And, you know, I did it because I wanted to be in the game. And, and in hindsight, I'm glad I did. But um, but uh I, I recognize that I needed to find some way to put a little more fuel on the fire and accelerate things a bit. Do you remember any deals in particular that were sort of that turning point where you're like, all right, if I do more of these kinds of deals, I, I, I think I can make a profession of this because eventually just I'll give people a sneak peek. You, like you, you left the corporate job. You like took the leap into being a full-time entrepreneur, but like, were there any that you can think of that were like, all right, this is, this is one that I, I, I'm successful on and I could do more of this to, to make a living. Yeah, I mean, um, well, the first owner, it, owner financing was, was really the key to me, uh, uh, finding like success and, and a long term success. And the way I found that the first, the first way I found that I'd sent, sent out a letter and, um, I'd been sending out letters for a while, but this particular deal came back to me, uh, as in a response from, I can't remember if it was the, the the actual seller or the real estate agent, but the seller had a real estate agent already enlisted. And she was like, why don't you get with my real estate agent? And uh, if you guys can work out a deal, great. And I'm like, well, I've been down this road before. Usually the agents get involved and it gets killed pretty quickly. But I was also ready to follow any lead I could all the way to the end, you know. So I got with this agent. He was actually receptive to the idea of proposing owner financing. And we worked it out. Uh, I think it was at like 6%, which back then was kind of the going rate. I can't remember. I'd have to look it up, but I think it was 6%. Um, and, and the agent like pushed everything along, you know, he got enough down payment to cover his commission. So I think he was happy with however it turned out. And I think, you know, I wasn't making a lot of money off of that one, but I, I was probably making like 300 bucks a month in cash flow. And that gave me a little confidence. I got one under my belt, you know, and, and got a little more familiar with that process because I wasn't, I, I, as much as I studied, studied owner financing, I still wasn't really that confident with it. It was still, it wasn't uh, intuitive or natural, you know, it was still a lot of thinking through every part of the part of the, through every step of the process. But, but then after that, I got another one uh, shortly thereafter, actually we bought a house uh, did that on owner financing. That was to move into. We were having a son and wanted to have a place that was a little easier to have him. So I got a little more comfortable then. But then I think the one that maybe would fit the description that you're giving is, uh, again, off of a letter I'd sent out, older gentleman, gentleman was ready to sell a house that had a little mother-in-law detached accessory dwelling unit in back. And, um, you know, it was kind of a slow dance, but we did uh, eventually work out a, another owner finance deal with a low 10% down. Uh, I borrowed the down payment on that place and um, didn't have to do much work, but I did a little. But it was shortly after that one where um, I started feeling like, okay, that's that's cool. Like I've had some uh, some successes that were close together. This is starting to feel like a pattern. Uh Again, I don't know if things are shifting or I'm just figuring it out, but it's starting to work. And, you know, I, I was not, I did not necessarily feel like I was ready to, to make a change at that point, but I was, I was, uh, I had a mentor I was working with at the time and he was the one who gave me the confidence. He, he told me I was ready. And even when he told me, I'm like, I don't know, man, I, I have a lot of trust and faith in what you say, a lot of confidence in the things that you say, but that seems like a stretch, but you know, over the course of a month or, or so, uh, I kept wanting him to be right, you know, and, and, um, he finally convinced me that I was ready to do it. And so 
we had a little bit of money in the bank. My wife was working, which made it a little easier. Um, it was a little unnerving because uh, we were having, like I, I quit my job literally like a month before I had my first, first child, our son. And it felt like the dumbest thing, the dumbest timing in the world. But again, my mentor, Greg, he was like, no, you know, uh, it's not going to get any easier from here. I know it seems like a weird time to be doing this, but it's as good as time as any right now. So, and it was also good. I mean, honestly, uh, not to get too far off track, but that, that was a big motivation for me having my son coming, uh, it forced me to kind of look at who I was and how I was modeling. And, uh, I thought to myself, okay, do I, do I want to, do I want to bring my son up, uh, being a role model that is just grinding it out in a, in a corporate job I'm not happy with or not excited about, uh, that really isn't bringing me where I want to go? Or do I want to show him that I'm the type of person that is willing to, um, you know, take some calculated risks and, and, um, go and pursue the things that, you know, I'm really passionate about and, and want to, uh, want to pursue. And, and ultimately I just decided that, you know, when my son arrives in this world, I want to be, I want to be that man. I want to be the latter. And so as, as much as it was like crazy for me to be doing it, it also, that that being the circumstance stance I actually motivated me to make that change at the same time. I think that's beautiful as a father myself. And also I mentioned with Greg Penio, your mentor was also a teacher and mentor for me. And, you know, sometimes you have to get that push out of the nest from, from outside your, outside your comfort zone. So thank you to those mentors in the world and the coaches in the world. But I, I totally resonate with the idea of like being the kind of person and you and I are both entrepreneurs. Like, and I, I know everybody listening to this, there's, there's kind of a spectrum I've found of people who are more entrepreneurial and they're willing to take some pretty big risks. Other people who are like, no, 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 like W2 job for the next 20 years. And then I'll leave once I have replaced my income. Like all of those are fine. Like there's no... You know, some some leaps are smaller than others, but I will say, if you're going to be a real estate investor, we all have to take this these leaps of faith, whether it's a big one or a small one. And that's so. It, hearing how you found that kind of motivation to do that, and also the trepidation and like the fear that's real that we all have when you do it, like that's I think that's super helpful to hear because it's it's, it's messy behind the scenes and it's not always clear cut what's going to happen. And you, I mean, in your own mind, I bet maybe you could tell me like you also imagine the failure scenario, scenario like what, what's this going to look like if this thing just crashes and burns and how stupid would I feel if that happened? I mean, all that's going through your head. Yeah, no, that's a good clarification. You know, I, I, um, uh, I just wasn't happy where I was, you know, like it was, it wasn't what I wanted to be doing, but I think a lot of people, there are probably people out there that can relate. You, when you have a steady income, it's very easy to get attached and comfortable with that steady income. There's a sense of security there whether secure or not, you, you have that sense. Um, and so that's why I felt like, you know, that was the right move for me. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was really scary. It was hard. I mean, every morning, boy, it was hard, but it was motivating, you know, um, that sense of, uh, am I going to be able to pull this off? I mean, there were times we were, we were within a month of not having enough money, to, to make it work, even, you know, with my wife's income and, um, and I just had to figure it out. Uh, so it was touch and go there, uh, more or less for a little bit, but, but, you know, like going back to <clears throat> kind of hitting that plateau a little bit before where I didn't feel like I was finding su the success to begin with. And then, um, getting to this point now that we're talking about where it was like, can I make this work? You know, I'm finding some success, but, I don't, it's not all figured out right now. And I'm taking this leap of faith. <clears throat> Both of those were really some of the most uh, rewarding times of my life by far. Yeah, not by far, but in a big way, I should say. Um, I, you know, I've, I've, I felt so uh, proud of what I'd accomplished once I came through the other end and I learned a lot about myself and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I grew so much, so much growth came through those periods of time that it was really such a cool journey. And I know everyone says it's all about the journey the whole time. I, 
I, I couldn't have cared less about that journey. In fact, I was kind of like, this, this is a grind. This is really hard. But once I got through it, it, it really was, I, I realized it really was all about the journey. That was, uh, that, that as much as anything was, was the most rewarding part, you know? Uh, it was pretty cool actually. Yeah. It makes good stories, which is why I'm, I'm loving digging into this. And one of the things you, know, you had to grow on a lot of fronts, but one of the specific ones that we can relate to today is you had to learn how to buy deals with financing outside the typical, you know, traditional put 20% down because like, like me, I had the same situation. You're not that bankable when you don't have a full-time job. Like you, you walk into a bank, right. they're, they're going to cut you off fast. And all of us eventually run out of down payment money when you're buying one, two, three, four properties. So let, let's go back. If you don't mind, I want to dig in to the extent you're willing to share some of the details of those early deals. Like the one you mentioned where the gentleman, um, you had an accessory dwelling unit in the backyard and you bought it. You know, you, you said you had to put a down payment. You said that he agreed to a, an interest rate over time. I, I want to go back just to that conversation. So you sent him a letter and mm -hmm. What, what, what does a typical letter like that say in your, in your case? And then I, I'd like to just kind of chronologically go from the letter to the conversation to like how, how an owner financing deal actually like kind of blooms and comes to be. Yeah. I mean, that letter, I mean, I've done so many different iterations of those letters, but that one in particular, uh, I think I mentioned we had, we had just bought a house to live in right before that. And, um, he had called off that letter. So we'd sent out a letter. It was the, you know, pretty standard letter that even you'll get with like a real estate purchase and sale offer, uh, where it's, you know, picture of my wife and I, she's pregnant. Like we're looking for a house. Um, we want to move into it, raise our family there. And, um, so we sent that out and this was in the same neighborhood that we had bought our house in that we did end up living in. But the guy called off that letter. I'm like, well, uh, we're not really looking for that anymore. We actually did find a house through these letters, but, uh, maybe, maybe I'm still interested in buying it. And so that's, that's how we got connected. And then, um, we just hit it off. You know, uh, one thing I've learned with seller financing in your marketing is that, um, we're, we're looking for sellers as, as much, if not more than we're looking for properties. You know, I think a lot of times we think oh, I'm looking for this house and this house. And yeah, you know, we're always looking for the house. That's kind of the core of real estate, but the seller, the right seller is what makes it all work, you know? And so this guy was the right seller. It just was clicking from the get go. It was easy. Um, he was on board. Uh, and I think, I think it was the first meeting I just said, are, are you, are you open to owner financing? And he's like, sure. You know, and I was kind of like, oh, you are. Usually, usually I don't get that response, but he was. And, um, and so it was just, I put a proposal in front of him. I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm fuzzy on the details now. These, these things are so far in the past, but I more than likely I put a proposal in front of him, said, here's what I'm looking for. And then it was, I do remember it being some back and forth and eventually we got there, but it was a 10% down payment. I do remember that. Uh, I actually borrowed that from a line of credit that I'd established through the first property that we had bought um, and built up equity. in. I got a, it was a small line of credit, but the purchase of the house that we're talking about now, I think was like 260, 280, somewhere in there. So 10% down, you know, that's only 25, $30,000. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge sum. So I didn't need a, a real big line of credit for that. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it came together. And then did a little work on that ADU, got them both rented out. And I, I think, you know, I think I remember I was cash flowing like $800 from day one. Uh, and that, that wasn't including, you know, any maintenance you might want to put aside or management, anything like that. But if you just took out the hard fixed costs, um, you know, I was doing okay from day one. So and this will bring up some principles that we can go back to on some of your more recent deals. So when mm -hmm. you're when you're running the numbers on the seller financing, at least in my mind, is pretty similar to any other deal. It's like, all right, here's the rent potential, here's my costs, operating costs, taxes, insurance, maintenance, things like that, and then here are my total financing costs. And you sort of work it backwards to to whatever you can pay somebody. So for example, you had you had your seller financing payment to him. Do you, do you happen to remember what the interest rate is? If you don't remember that, don't worry about it, but just, yeah. I do actually that, that one was like three point, 
it was like 3.1 or something like that. He want, he was more worried about the the payment amount. That's how we ended up at the point one or whatever it was. Got it. Did he, did he work it backwards to where he knew what his rent was before and it was a certain percentage of that rent or like how, from his standpoint, like he, it is kind of surprising. He said, yeah, I'm open to seller financing. Cause that doesn't happen. That's not the norm in my right. experience either. But like, how did that conversation go back and forth? Did you mention the number first? And then he's like, no, I want more. Like, I'm just curious. Cause that's a, that's a, sometimes, sometimes a sticker of a negotiating, negotiating point. I mean, I remember he had a, he had a price in mind for the house and I, and I said, fine, let's do that. And then, and then the, the interest rate, really the payment was where I, I really needed to, um, negotiate hard. And it, and it was, it was a lot of back and forth. Like I said, it wasn't like, here's the interest rate I need. And he said, great. I had to really, um, show him why I needed to be there, uh, I had to explain like, here, here's what I need to put into it. Here's what that's going to cost me. Here's what I think my rents are. Um, he, he had been renting it pretty low to begin with, you know, he knew we could get more, but he'd been renting it pretty low. So he didn't really work his numbers backwards. And he wasn't in that, he wasn't that type of guy anyways. He was, he was just kind of ready to move on. He was retired, had plenty of money. He wasn't going to give it away, but, um, but yeah, you know, it was, it was really just me hammering home that here's where I need to be. Here's where I need to be. And, you know, we, it, it was not an easy negotiation on that aspect of it. <clears throat> um, but we had a good enough relationship that we were able to arrive at a number that worked for everybody that everyone could be happy with. And, um, and yeah, and that's kind of how we pulled that one through. So you got about a 3.1% interest rate. You got a 10% down payment. Two hundred sixty, two hundred eighty thousand dollars purchase. Do you remember how long the terms were? Because this is another one people wonder about with owner financing. Can you get a thirty-year loan? Does it have to be a five-year? Like, what, what, what? Where did that go? Yeah, that that one was fifteen years. It was a fifteen-year note, and that one did have a thirty-year amortization on it. I think that I don't know. Someone's going to double check this, but I want to say that payment was like nine hundred bucks a month or something like that. Um, I could be wrong. But yeah, I did a 15 year note, 30 year AM with a 15 year balloon on it. Got it. And so just to like step back from this, so like every deal you're trying to figure out how, how I'm going to make money on it. So you, you ran the numbers and said, all right, I've got to pay the seller. I've got to pay my line of credit as well. So I'm going to have some fixed costs. I want to make a certain amount of cash flow. I also assume you, you kind of had this neighborhood zoned out. This is a farming neighborhood where you're, you're look, not, not literally farming. This is your farm neighborhood where you're trying to invest. So right. you, you have some long-term quality kind of metrics that you're like, all right, if I hold on to this property for the next five, 10 years, I don't know where it's going to go, but this is going to have some good tailwinds. It's going to be a good appreciating market over the long run. And so this is a buy and hold deal for you, right? This is just like, I got to make some cash flow in the short run. And I think I'm going to make more money over the long run. Is that sort of, is that the play? Is that the, how you looked at it at that point? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think I, I was nervous at first because, you know, all I'd ever known before that was a 30 year amortization loan where everything's paid off at the end of it. And that's, it's not hard to be comfortable with that if you can get the numbers to work. Right. Because there's really, there's not as much of a trap as opposed to a 15 year balloon. Right. Um, uh, even with that amortization, you're not, you're not going to be paid down that much. Um, but maybe enough to refinance. And so I think as far as looking at what, uh, down, downstream exit strategies were, it was, you know, we'll get some pay down. I could probably come up with some cash if I had to refinance this in 15 years. Um, more than likely. So we were in the, we were in a down cycle at the time and I felt pretty confident. You know, they always say that cycles go in seven to tier, seven to 10 year cycles, right? So I felt pretty confident that in the next seven to 10, we start seeing some appreciation and hopefully enough to, again, build more equity to where I could um, at least refinance it at whatever the rate would be at that point in time. Um, but even then, honestly, I was still nervous. I'm like, that's still uncertainty to me, but um, I, I was just encouraged again by my mentor to just, um, take that step. And, and I think ultimately it was just, we'll figure it out at that point in time. There will be enough, there will be enough mm -hmm. options that uh, something will work. And worst case scenario too, we could always sell it. Right. 
unless the market just totally took a dump and, um, and there was just no salvaging it, then, then we should be able to sell it. Uh, even if we're just breaking even on it or even taking a small loss, you know, got it. So let's fast forward on this deal. I want to ask about some other deals you've done, but just to give people like a, a picture of this, it's really cool to see deals that started, I don't know, this is 2009 or 10 or whatever, whenever it is, like we're now 13 years later, like what's that, what's that individual property, if you still own it, look like today? Like what, how, how have things changed and where is it today? Yeah. You mean most like numbers wise or? Yeah. Yeah. Just like that. Cause yeah. you bought it for 260, 280. What's the value of it? Where's the rent now? You know, what, yeah. what, what does your loan situation look like on it? Yeah. So it's, it's, I'm sure the value is more than doubled. You know, it's, um, it's got to be worth around 700,000 now, which is pretty cool. Um, and let's see, uh, rents. I don't even remember what I rented it out for at first, but that's, that's probably come close to having doubled at this point as well. Um, and then what I've done since then is I actually did end up refinancing it, you know, when the interest rates had hit that low, low, uh, I did a, I did a refinance on it. I think I did, I think what I did too, is I did a cash out refinance on that and I used that cash to pay off some other properties. So I got that one. And, and a few other ones at, at those low interest rates, somewhere in the threes, uh, long-term fixed, and then took, took some extra cash in that equity and paid off some other properties to get those free and clear. Love it. That's how the, the chess game works, right? You have these assets, they go up in value. I, I, just, I think it's, it's so cool to see. There's a lot of work on the front end. There's a lot of uncertainty. You had to learn how to, the skills of offering under financing. But the magic of real estate is holding on. Like it's, it's that it's those waves that are we have no control over, but we get to ride those waves almost like a surfer. You know, like these waves of appreciation, these waves of growth. I've seen that in my own portfolio. I was I was actually really surprised because most of my properties I bought, it's like yeah, it might appreciate. I think it will appreciate, but I had no idea when or how much. And then you right. hit these you hit these years where it goes up ten. 20%, you know, even 5%. And like, that's, that's where your net worth and your wealth really starts growing. And it gives you more options to refinance, to sell, to do things. But the, the, the early in your career, you just got to get your foot in the door, which is why seller financing, I think is such a key tool because you, you leveraged one property you bought before by using a HELOC or a line of credit to put a down payment on this property, which you, know, you didn't have the cash out of pocket to do it. You had to stretch, you had to take a risk, but now, yeah you've had hundreds of thousands of dollars in additional net worth, you know, thousands of dollars in extra cash flow. That's just one deal. Like if you multiply mm -hmm. that out over, you know, five, 10 deals, like that's, or 20 deals, that's, this is how, this is how you put the pieces together. So I'm just, I don't know if, that, if that's an accurate portrayal of kind of your bigger picture of how this all worked, but I think it's pretty cool to see how those pieces all come together. Yeah, no, I think it's an accurate portrayal. And I think it's, um, you know, going back to all that fear and trepidation of not feeling like that, 15 year balloon was really settled, you know, what well, I wasn't used to that. So that was, that was stepping out on a limb and it, it was, there, there's, there is risk there, you know, um, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be the type of person who doesn't fulfill my promises. And I saw that loan making that loan as a promise that I wanted to fulfill. Um, and, and that like weighed on me heavily, but I'm so glad I did take that leap. It obviously worked out really well for me. And, um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's crazy, man. It's crazy when you first do a couple of those and at least it was for me, but, uh, yeah, in the long run, as things kind of play out, um, it sure does open things up and, and, and it does become easier as you go. For sure. So, so I want to pause here to take a little, little like kind of teaching moment to let you teach some, and I'm going to offer a couple of tips. And then I want to go to your, another seller financing deal you've done more recently, because I think it'll be interesting for people to hear how this also works in today's market. This isn't just a thing that worked in 2010, but I, I want to go back to the seller and why they would actually sell or finance and maybe some of the mechanics of that. So you, you know, we kind of glossed over a little bit of the details, but like this owner, for them to be able to finance it to you, essentially they're becoming your bank. So they, mm -hmm. instead, instead of them taking 200,000, in your case, what, 240,000 bucks, instead of them taking that money, putting it in the bank and you have to go get another loan, they are agreeing to take the payments over time for the equity they have in the property. So I just want to mention that to people who are kind of trying to understand what owner financing is, but that leaves kind of the big question is why would a seller 
agree to finance it to you? Like, is that, is, is that something? Cause when so people are new to seller finance and they're like, yeah, who would agree to that? Like, would anybody agree to that? Yeah. Like, why, why would they right. agree? So, so maybe g give me your, your thoughts, because I think it's helpful to get in the, in the head of the potential sellers. You mentioned the seller is the key here. Like, why would a yeah. seller finance to you? And what would you tell somebody today? Like, what are, what are some of the benefits of you doing this with me? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing I'd say is that most won't, you know, and, and I'm going to say that first because, uh, it can get really discouraging if you think that you can just kind of convince every seller that it's a good idea for them because it's not a good idea for most people, you know, and they'll tell you that. Um, and, and I found it's not usually something it's difficult to talk people into it. You know, you can do it if they're unfamiliar with it or whatever, but it's, it, it, it can be hard to convince someone that they should do seller financing. Um, so those things happen, but it's a lot of work and it's few and far between where you can pull it off. What I've found where I've found more success is that, uh, it's generally the person that's going to accept an owner financed offer is someone who, um, a has the equity to do it, right? You can't, you can't finance a property that you only have 10% equity in. I mean, you can, but you can only, you know, the finance that portion is usually not going to make a lot of sense for the seller. So ideally you find someone who owns the place free and clear that, that uh, paves the way for a pretty clean seller financed transaction. But the ones that would want to, uh, the reasons they want to, I've found generally it's um, one, they like the idea of income. Um, sure. They can take the money out of, out of that sale and put it into something else where, you know, an annuity or, or whatever, CDs, I don't know, um, any other investment vehicle, but, uh, the sellers I've found that are, that are keen on doing the owner financing, like the idea of, uh, still having this collateral that they know and are very familiar with and, um, are comfortable with, which is the house, right? That's the collateral for the loan. Um, they like the idea of being able to still essentially collect the rent, right? They're used to that rent coming in, that income every month. And so they're still basically getting that. It's just, um, you know, packaged a little differently, but it's the same idea. Um, and then, uh, what was the other? Oh, the other big one is, um, the capital gains, right? If they get cashed out on, you know, a, Five hundred thousand uh, dollar building, then that's five hundred thousand dollars of income all realized in one year, as opposed to you know getting some of that down payment in year one. Um, you know if it's amortized, they're getting some of that principal back over the course of time, so they're not paying. Uh, they're not. It might not put them up in the higher tax bracket right away, and then you know getting cashed out down the road um, at a smaller sum can be beneficial to some people too. Those are the ones that come to mind right off the top of my head. Yeah, I think that's well said. I was just going to add color commentary, maybe a little bit of a story on my end. The 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 very first deal I did was small enough that the capital gains tax issue was not really like on their mind. And so a lot of the properties I sure. bought early in my career, I think it's a little different because I'm in a, you know, I'm in South Carolina, the properties were like 70,000 and 120,000 and 150,000. Right. But when you get up into like, 500,000 and million dollar properties, like the capital gains thing's huge. Like that could be, yeah. you know, if you're gonna make a million dollar capital gain in one year, but you could, instead you could in, receive it in installments or maybe even just get interest only for a while and not pay any tax on the capital gain for a while. You still have to pay, you have to recapture your depreciation. That's something like a little right. t tidbit that people just need to set aside if you hadn't heard of that. Um, I did a YouTube video on that, so I'll, I'll put a link to the, the, if you want to nerd out on how much tax you pay when you sell a rental property, I had a, I had a moment where I'm like, I'm just going to make a video and so all the details and the spreadsheet. And so when a seller sells a property, they don't have to pay capital gains necessarily right off the bat if they do an installment sale, but they do have to recapture the depreciation, which is something right. you're, they need to know about because if they're going to have a big tax hit that you need to like inform them of that, that they need to talk to their CPA and help them figure out how to handle that through a down payment, through some other means. But the point, I guess my other point is, the psychology of sellers who would be willing to sell it to me, I, I focus on those first two, the income and then on the security. And I, the first, very first deal I bought with seller financing were from Ed and Eileen, who are still to this day like special people to me because they were they took a chance on me when I was like 24 years old and 
Uh, Eileen oh. had like she had like a twinkle in her eye, and, and she said, "Yeah, I got your letter. I showed it to the real estate agent who I was thinking about working with." And she said, "Don't ever work with an investor. They're all bad, and they're not going to help you." And, <laughs> yeah. but, but but Eileen said, "I looked you up on Google, Chad, and I think I think I'm going to take a chance on you." I, I I said, "She's wrong about this," and I said, "Well, thank you. Like I hope I, I think I think that's true." Um, but we we sat and talked. We they it was a vacant house, and they had, used to have it as a rental property. But they were retired Methodist ministers, and they were not professional investors. And they had moved to a little retirement home on a lake, and they you know, were, had to get a mortgage to do that. And so this is a stretch for them, but they were trying to make this pieces work for their retirement. And their tenants just tore the property up. They trashed it, and they just said, we're not, we're not cut out for this. So that's right when I sent them a letter was when they finally got it cleaned up. So they got this little card table. They set it out in the living room. We sat across from each other, and she taught me, and I, I wrote about this in the book, actually, how she taught me and Ed taught me how to negotiate because they were like, we're not going to talk about the deal yet. I want to get to know you, Chad, and you. I want to, and so I had to tell my stories, and I had to listen to their stories, and you know who who they were and what they're all about. And I just I think that's an important point about seller financing. Not every person is going to be like Ed and Eileen and want to want to talk stories, but it's a relationship thing. It's not just a transactional. Here's the seller financing. Let's talk the details. Like it's a it's a trust. Like you have to trust one another, and that's essentially what what any agreement, any contract is, is a trust between two people. And Ed and Eileen taught me that, like I need to learn if my story of buying this property is going to kind of fit the puzzle pieces together with their story. And it doesn't always fit, right? That's why you're never going to bat 100. percent But I, for them, the story, like to fast forward to the end of their story, the offer I made them, and actually I didn't mention seller financing at first because I think you, there's some people who know about seller financing, they know what it means. A lot of people don't though, and in their case, it was not something they're familiar with. So I didn't talk about it until I made them an offer, and I actually made them a couple of offers. I said, here's here's what I could pay if I paid cash. And what I mean by cash is I got to go to my friend Joe, and he's going to loan me money at 10% interest, and I'm going to buy this property. If I, but I could pay you 100000 bucks, for example. Or if you'll work with me and let me make you payments every month, I'll take care of the management. I'll handle the tenants. If the tenant moves out and doesn't pay, I'll still make the payments to you. I'll fix the property up. So you don't have to mess with the tenants anymore, but you could get $500 per month for the next, you know, in this case, maybe 15 years. And, and just let me handle the property. You essentially be my bank. I'll pay you this price. And I was a little more aggressive. I wasn't p overpaying. I wasn't paying more than the property was worth. But because it was a great location, kind of like you, I could hold on to it and make some cash flow today to, to let, until the property went up in value. I was willing to pay a little bit more of a premium and I could still make a cash flow. And so I explained it to them from the number one standpoint, you could continue getting income in your retirement and I'll do all the work, I'll handle everything. That's essentially explaining owner financing, but I just wasn't saying there'll be an owner financing contract. You'll be seller, it'll be seller carry back mortgage. You'll have this interest rate. I started with the story, and then I also set your second point, which is right on to me too. I said, and you'll have the security of this house because I hope you trust me. But what happens if I get run over by a bus because I live in Clemson and we haven't built any sidewalks or trails yet, which I've been trying to work on for a long time. But it's very good chance I'll get hit by a bus or a truck because we can't walk in my town without getting around. But if that happens and I can't make the payments to you because my heirs are just, you know, don't do it, then you can take this property back and you can keep my down payment and keep any repairs I made. So like that security, like that, but again, it's a story. It's like, if I get run over by a bus, I've told that story like hundreds of times now in my career. Those two things were like, kind of made it more real. And then they're like, well, I'm open to that, okay. And, and so then we went into the details of, all right, well, here's how it would work. You can of course get an attorney to look it over, but we'll have a closing attorney who draws up the paperwork. And essentially I'll, you'll get some money at closing, but then over time, every month, starting on May 1st, I'll start making this payment. So I guess I say all of that is that for me, like I learned a ton about the psychology of seller financing by just listening to stories and understanding that it's a puzzle. And every, every puzzle is a little different. Like Ed and Eileen are one story, your, your seller was another story. Um, I don't know, does that, did, have you had any kind of similar kind of thoughts about that, about how just solving a puzzle is essentially what you have to do here to, to get a seller financing deal done. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, you know, it's like any negotiation, everything needs to work for everybody, you know? And, um, I think it's just with seller financing, there's just a lot of things, a lot of variables that can play into that. You know, you have a lot of different things you need to figure out and, and 
it, that's what makes it fun though, right? Is because they're the down payment might, might, might be the thing that is important to them, or it might not, you know, the, the interest rate might be the thing that's important to them, or it might not, you know, maybe it's the payment every month and they don't care about the interest rate. Maybe it's the, um, maybe the price is the biggest thing, you know? And, and so there's all these different variables that, um, you can, you can work with and decide like, well, okay, that's important to them, but it's not important to me. So I can give them that. Uh, but this is important to me. And then, you know, is, is that important to them? No, it's not. So, so, you know, yeah, there's lots of ways that you can work through it. But what I really liked about this, there's so many things that come to mind. Like there's so many little, uh, nuances about you know, owner financing, but what I liked about w- what, what you said in that story was that, um, you didn't, you didn't start talking about owner financing, right? You didn't start labeling it. And, and I think that's, that's a really good point. And something I've learned, uh, to kind of answer your question too, is that staying away from that, like jargon, you know, and, and technical terms and stuff and just in, in explaining it and presenting it in a way that, um, that is like palatable to them, you know, is really important because everyone has different levels of, of understanding. And, you know, I, I think that's awesome. I really like that story because I've always um, wanted to be better at being able to take someone from really low level understanding of what owner financing was and be able to bring them along. And I think it's really commendable that, that you were able to do that. I, I, I've done it, but I'm, I'm not very good. I'm not very good at that. Most of my success has just come from like the, the lower hanging fruit where I just find the seller that knows about it. And I say, you know, are you willing to do owner finance? And at some point, you know, I don't just drop that right up front. Uh, the, the other line that's worked for me a lot is to, to say, um, I think a good way to approach it has been to say, would you prefer to get cashed out or take payments or, or would you prefer to get tap cashed out or are you willing to take payments? And, um, you know, and then you see if there's even like a, a, you get a di- idea of what their understanding of that is and B, you know, how, how open that door is. The other reasons I thought of as you were talking, why people might uh, accept an owner financing offer um, is one, sometimes the property isn't financeable to begin with, you know, and if you tell them you don't have the cash to do it, then they're gonna, that's, that's one way they can get it sold. The other reason uh, is might just be that they're, they're really motivated to sell, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, they might just say, sure, whatever, let's just get it done. Um, so you just never know, man. I mean, and I'm sure there's other reasons out there too. Yeah. You gotta have an open mind. And I, one thing I look at it, I look at seller financing as like a tool in a toolbox. And I think some people, they're going to get in their head, Oh, I'm going to go buy a property with seller financing. And they try to take the tool out of the toolbox ahead of time and go hit people with a hammer, <laughs> like hammer, 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 yeah. hammer. Yeah. It's, instead of saying, all right, my job as a real estate investor is to increase the number of tools I have in my toolbox. You know, getting a conventional loan is one tool. Getting hard money or private money is another tool. Seller financing is one. Subject to is another. Lease. So, like, the better you get, the more tools you have in the toolbox. And yeah. then, if you go approach somebody with an open-minded idea, like I, I really, I, I tell, I, I tell the seller this, like, look, at best, if you could really call me a, a, a tr- someone who's trying to put a puzzle together. Like I understand mm-hmm. real estate pretty well, but I don't understand your situation at all. So if you, exactly. if, you and I, if, if you and I could talk, it's essentially going to be like putting puzzle pieces on the table. And my job is to see, will these puzzle pieces fit together or not? And it's very possible it won't like, right. It's, I try to be upfront about that. Like it's very possible that you and I talk and my solution that I offer is not a good fit for you. And I'm totally okay with that. And that's great. And whatever you learn from me is awesome. And so it kind of diffuses the situation when you, when you can, you use a metaphor to say, I'm just trying to put a puzzle together. And if it works, I would love to help you. If it doesn't, that's fine. Because if you come across too hard, like, you know, a lot of investors come across, here's what I can do, take it or leave it, hard pressure sales. Yeah, it's just a different, different approach. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that that's, uh, that's the key too, is, is being educated on what all the different strategies and tools are, right? And then you're right. And then it's just a matter of figuring out if, if you can connect the dots from there. Um, and you can't always, like you said, but but when you have a good understanding of the, the, you know, the breadth of the different different tools that are available out there, that's when that's when it becomes fun too. You know, you're not just like shotgunning offers out there and saying take it or leave it, like you said. But you're really becoming a problem solver, solver, and that that's cool. I mean, 
you know, you, I'd heard about, uh, you know, everyone's saying, well, let's, let's make these negotiations, negotiations, win, win. And you're like, well, okay. Yeah. Uh, if, if they like taking my low offer, then we'll both, we're both going to win, you know, but, but, but that, that was, you know, that was really, that was win lose. Right. So, uh, but that was as, that was as much as I, that was as far as I'd taken my education in real estate is that I just thought that's what real estate investing was. And, you know, that never felt good to me. And so I was so, it really became appealing to me, real estate in, in general, when I realized that, um, that, uh, everyone can get where they're trying to go and everyone can, can maybe actually exceed their expectations when they're working together and everyone's trying to understand, um, one to understand where everyone's coming from, but trying to get everyone, uh, to a good place. You know, I think when, when both parties are, are, um, moving in the same direction and trying to, trying to work in each other's best interest, that's, that's really when, when my best deals have come together, not only financially, but just, you know, intrinsically, uh, it just feels a lot better when you can do something like that. Yeah, it's so much fun. I love it. I mean, yeah. one of the one yeah. of the most most fun parts of the business to me are the people and the they call them, you call them negotiations, but they're really like conversations like this. You know, that's yeah. I tell people when I first started doing my YouTube channel back in 2014 was I was doing all these like whiteboard little you know, I, I would draw for the seller or a private lender. Here's how a real estate deal would work. Here's a little happy person over here and draw. An, so I would just like put my little bad drawings on a, on a YouTube video every once in a while. And people started watching. I'm like, really? Why, why are they watching my private money and seller financing videos? And, but to your point, it's like, this is a, at its best, like if people want to look for like your knowledge will increase your ability to solve problems. Like that's really what it comes down to. And to me, there, there's a lot of different ways to invest in real estate, but the, the, the approach you take, you know, Anthony, I, I really respect what you've done. You know, you've you've been deliberate. You've we've heard of your personal story, but you you've used these tools really well. Like you've put them together, and it's benefited a lot of people. And so let, let's I, I want to fast forward it a little bit. So we we've kind of spent some time on your early deals, your journey, your you know people. I told people in the beginning you have about twenty five units now. So you've come a long way from those early days. But talk to me. You you did a deal recently that sort of demonstrates some of these principles we're talking about, and but doing it in a different market where you bought another property. So would you mind kind of unpacking a little bit of the details of that one as well? So this last one, uh, I, you know, I'm not really even in big buying mode right now. I, I haven't been sending out marketing, doing any of that. I mean, I'm, I think I'm, I'm like you, if, if there's a deal out there, I'm, I, I know enough now that I'd, I'd want to pursue it. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not actively out, um, hunting a whole lot, but this particular one is about five blocks or so from my house. And, um, uh, uh, I drive by it all the time. It's a commercial building. So on the bottom floor is a restaurant and on the top floor, I didn't even realize that there's two apartments up there. I've driven by it thousands of times. Never, never really paid that much attention to it. But, um, anyway, so I'm driving by this building and I see a for rent sign in the window upstairs, you know, and it's not like, a <coughs> you know, X, Y, Z company property management. It's one of those little ones you get from home Depot or whatever. It says for rent, call this number, you know, and that's about it. And, and, um, I'm like, okay, that's a person, right? That's someone I could talk to. And that's very, very likely the owner of this building. Uh, my wife and I had been, um, just the way we're set up, we, we thought it'd be nice if we had somewhere else to host people. And so I'm like, well, what if, what if we just rented that apartment up there? Like I said, it's five blocks from our house and, uh, we could, we could Airbnb it. But then when people are in town, we could have them stay there if we didn't have enough room at our house. All our family lives out of town. So we have people coming to visit us pretty frequently. And sometimes it's more than we can really manage at our house. Also, so people, just, uh, people like me and my family who came to visit you and you had to like figure out an Airbnb for us as well, right? That's so that, right. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that was was, fun. <laughs> that's exactly right. So um, so you're like, well, that would be kind of cool. So I went to my wife and I'm like, hey, you know, I found this. What do you think? And she's like, that's dumb. Like <laughs> she's Anthony, you're an idiot. There's no way they're going to do that. I'm like, well, like, can we just go ask him? She's like, fine, let's go look. Let's go ask. And so we get in there, we walk through the apartment and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it could work. It was kind of shabby. It hadn't been kept up real well. Um, but then we went downstairs and we were talking in the restaurant and 
And, uh, and, and I'm sorry to rewind a little bit. I called them up and I told them up front, that's what I was trying to do. You know, I didn't want to waste their time or, or come across manip- manipulative at all. So I'm like, here's what I'm thinking. I know it's unconventional, but if you guys are open to it, I'd like to talk to you about it. And they're like, uh, that's different, but, um, sure. You know, let's, we'll at least talk about it. If nothing else, I'm just curious to, you know, see you and see if you're crazy or, or what's going on. So went there, went downstairs. We're talking about it a little bit and they're like, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it could work, but here's the issue. We're actually trying to sell this building. We have a buyer right now. Um, we haven't signed anything around, but we're, we're negotiating with them. So it'll likely be sold. I don't know, you know, if they're going to be open to this type of arrangement down the road. So I'm like, huh, well, you know, uh, maybe we should just buy it. And they're like, uh, yeah, maybe they were a little bit, a little bit hesitant because I think they felt like they were already semi committed to these previous buyers. And so they're like, you know, if you want to, if you want to put an offer in fine, I just don't want you to get your hopes up because I feel kind of loyal to these, these buyers right now. So I'm like, okay. So I went, I just put the strongest offer I could out there. Um, you know, crunched the numbers really hard, went over it back and forth. They had given me a number that they had in mind. I think it was, it was like one, 1. 1.5 million or something for this building. And so, uh, again, I just put a proposal. It was a really generic proposal. It wasn't even an offer. It was just line items. I tried to keep it simple. That's another thing I've learned too, is that I try and keep it. Uh, if I am put it, presenting a, an owner finance offer, I try to do it more as like a, a very, um, simple, just bullet point, you know, it's easy to explain and easy to digest the fewer numbers and and words in there, the better, I think. So that's what I did. So I took it to him. I said, here's what I have in mind. And he said, okay, we'll see, you know, I'll run it by these guys and see if they can match that. I guess they hadn't even got to the point of an offer yet. And so, uh, so he did, and you know, a couple of days went by and he said, okay, it sounds like they're not willing to match that. So, you know, we can move ahead on it. And, um, and so we did. So what was, uh, the, what was the offer? I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now, like, what, what, what was, was the initial <laughs> offer? Um, the purchase price offered was 1.4 million with a 30% down payment. So that's four four 420,000. And then an interest rate of uh, 4.75%. And the other terms in there, if you really want to get in the weeds with it, were I had proposed uh, four months of no interest accrual. And I did that because I knew we were going to get in the upstairs units and remodel them. So I'd ask them to just hold off on any payments while we got the thing up and running and could get some income coming to support those payments. And then for the first uh, three years, we did interest only. And that's a big one, you know, with interest only as far as just uh, making owner finance work, interest only payments, interest only or more, more specifically. And that's a- another one I learned from Greg Pinio over there at Corco. Uh, it is, has really been the key to me finding a lot of success in owner financing because you're able to at least on the front end, keep your down or your, uh, your monthly payments lower, which is always the hardest part. You know, it takes years before you can build that rent up enough to support all the, uh, debt and expenses that you have on there. Not to tangent too much off this deal, but just thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, that's good. Uh, good, so good here, here's one of three were interest only or more. Uh, and then after, after that, we were, we were going to go into a 30 year amortization scenario. So it would be, um, up the payment to a amortized payment. And then we had a 20 year payout on that. So then after, after going through the, uh, inspection and everything, we ended up with a, of a per, at a purchase price of, um, one million three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and initially, even after this is kind of a little a little interesting uh, tidbit too. Even after inspection, we were still at four hundred thousand dollar down payment, but we ended up at three hundred fifty thousand dollars. And the way we worked that out was, as we got further into it, you know, I'm dumping cash into this thing, uh, trying to get it ready to go. Uh, I just, I just went to them, you know, a week before we were going to close. And I said, Hey guys, 400,000 is fine. If you, if you want to do that down payment, but I'm wondering if it's, if it's really that important to you, I would, I would love it if we could bring that down to $300,000. And I know we've talked about this before and you guys have said, I don't know. They were kind of, kind of iffy on it. 
So I just put it out there one more time, really nice, really soft. And, and they said, well, we can't do 300,000, but we'll do 350,000. So that was nice. That took a little pressure off me. Um, and, and again, I'm not trying to get into too many tangents, but one of the things we did with this too, is they allowed me to get in early. We didn't close on this. We started this back in, um, in April and I didn't close on this until last Friday. Uh, but they allowed me to get in the two apartments upstairs early and start remodeling those ahead of time, which was nice because I, again, I don't have any interest accrual. I'm still going to get those four months of no interest accrual once we close on it, but I got a two month head start on it, getting things remodeled, which, which helped out a lot. Um, but that's where I say, you know, I'm, I'm putting all this money into it. I'm like, geez, this is going to cost a little more than I thought. It's going to take a little more cash. Uh, and so th that's why they were kind of receptive to that. And they'd seen the work I was doing, you know, we're, we're doing a little extra up there and they appreciated that. Um, the interest rate did end up being four and three quarter percent. So we stuck with that. Uh, and then what I did too, with the down payment. So, so that's $350,000 plus I still have, I'll probably be about $125,000 into the remodel. But what I was able to do is I went to a, um, previous seller that I'd done an owner contract with on a, on a different building. And again, I just, you know, you, you build up rapport, you build up good relationships, relationships with these people, uh, personal, but also business relationships. And so I went back to this, this woman that I bought in a, a previous property from on, on owner financing. And I said, Hey, uh, I have this deal. I'm looking to get some cash put into play for it. Uh, that would help me out. Are you interested at all? And, she had actually just freed up some cash and the timing was great. And she said, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to work with you on that one. So what we did was remember earlier we were talking about, uh, the property with the mother-in-law and back. And I'd said, I'd, I'd done a cash out refi on that one so that I could get other properties free and clear. So I took one of those free and clear properties and I got a $300,000 note. I gave a $300,000 note to this woman that I was just talking about. And I used that for the majority of that down payment. So, uh, so I'll still be about, you know, $175,000 out of pocket. But for that right now, I'm using a, um, a credit line just so I don't have to come out of pocket on that. And, uh, and I plan to pay that credit line off with a, with another property that I have in escrow right now that I'm selling. So that's all the numbers on that one. Cool. I love, I love the puzzle. Those, those tangents are great, by the way. So don't, don't keep on going with the tangents because I, I think okay. the, the details of how you got the money, that's something not everybody shares. Like, so you, you had, you got seller financing for part of it that having to renegotiate, I assume you found some repairs that maybe exceeded your costs. You know, when you first negotiated it for 1.4, you had certain assumptions about it. You did an inspection. You, you brought, did you have to go back to them and say, Hey, we found this thing that we didn't expect. We got to get a little yeah, lower price. Right. So, that's right. so that's, that's you know, why you have a due diligence period and then you start remodeling it, which is interesting, getting it remodeled ahead of time before you close. And I guess, did you have some sort of escrow agreement or something where you knew they would sell it to you before you started spending your money on it? Or did you have to just trust them yeah. that they would do it? That's a good question. I mean, I did have, I had money in, um, yeah, we had, I had money in, um, in, uh, in escrow down the, not the down payment. What's the word I'm looking for? The earnest, earnest, money, earnest money was in there. Yeah. Um, I, I've never done that before. I know people who have, and I always thought it was a terrible idea, but in this case, I, I felt comfortable with it just because I felt like we were there. I felt like I had a good, a good sense of, um, what the sellers would do. <clears throat> you know, if things got a little weird, I, I didn't think that, I didn't think there was a very high risk. There's always risk in everything, but you're always just kind of evaluating that risk. And I evaluated this risk as being pretty low to where things could get nasty. And in fact, you know, part of the reason why this has been going on since April was that uh, we were supposed to close on it, I think the end of June, and there ended up being some title issues um, that they had to resolve. And, you know, if there was ever a time where it could have gone a little weird, it would have been then, then, and it, it didn't, you know, we worked through it together and, and got through it. So yeah, you know, I mean, it's, again, it's not something I, it made me a little uncomfortable, but, um, in this case, you know, I, I was pretty confident it would work out and it did. 
Very cool. And so the end result of this, and I, there's a couple points I want to highlight. So you bought a property that's a, a mixed use property. You have a commercial property downstairs, two apartments up. This whole deal started because you had this crazy idea of just renting the pro- apartment and having an extra place, but it turns into this bigger deal. And mm-hmm. you now have, I mean, rough numbers, you know, you've bought it for 1.35, put another 125,000 in it. So you're, you're like pushing on 1.5 or so into the, into the property. What, what's mm-hmm. the uh, what's the next step? So you're you're almost done with the remodel. You're getting through it. You now have two apartments that are ready. Are you gonna Airbnb those? Are you gonna do long term rentals? And then what's the what, what do you guess the numbers will look like when this when this deal is all said and done? Yeah, uh, my wife's been wanting to Airbnb for a while. Actually, she keeps asking me to find one of those projects, and I've been resisting it. But um, I guess we're gonna we're gonna try it just like everyone else and their mom. So that's what we're doing upstairs with those two units is we're going to, uh, we're going to Airbnb those. Hopefully those will be ready to go in October. Um, and then the downstairs will continue to be a restaurant that actually just changed hands recently. That was another wrinkle as we were kind of negotiating through, um, you know, getting a new tenant in there, which we did. I'm really, really excited about them. They're going to be a great fit for it. Um, so yeah, that that's the plan. That's how we're going to handle that. Got it. And so, do, do you have rough numbers on what like the total income will be? You know, you never know until you start running yeah. this stuff, right? But just I'm curious, right. like, you know, your mortgage payment compared to the rent, and then just sort of a, a best case scenario or regular scenario, what that might look like. Yeah, my my total debt service on it right now is about uh, six thousand dollars, a little less, and that that lease downstairs is going to be a triple net. So they're going to cover a good portion of the taxes, insurance, um, a lot of the utilities as well. Uh, we'll see, you know, what, what all those hard costs are as far as like electric and all that with the Airbnb. But what I'm hoping to gross on it is, you know, somewhere between 10, 10 and 11,000 is I, I think what is, is realistic on that. So, um, yeah, I think I think we'll do okay with it. You know, we're not gonna we're not gonna kill it, but I think we're gonna do okay with it. Cool. So even a multiple thousand dollar cash flow, maybe when you're all said and done, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so a deal, and I'm just I'm being that like the color commentator at a football game or something. So like, here's Anthony yeah. Pets and Michaela Pets doing a deal. So right. the, the the point is like you, you know, you weren't looking for a deal, but this is in your backyard. It's in your neighborhood. It's a deal that has potential over the long run. You had to like move some pieces around. You had to use seller financing plus some of your own cash plus equity from another property using a relationship with a private lender. So you use private money on the one hand for part of the down payment, seller financing for this portion, some of your own cash as well. And then you used your knowledge and your creativity to not only negotiate and make an offer that maybe they wouldn't have thought about, but then also your operational knowledge of how to turn a property around and fix it up. And the idea of, of this could be an Airbnb rental, what's that look like? So th- there's just a bunch of pieces that they have to fit together that you have that you had in your head and you had the wisdom and the knowledge to do it. But seller financing being a key component of that, like if you had to go to the bank in, in you know mid-year 2023 and get a commercial loan for a property, I mean, that's what? seven, eight percent interest rate, mm-hmm. 15, mm-hmm. 20 year amortization. I mean, you're, you're looking at more like a $10,000 payment probably. I don't know. I don't, I'm just doing, throwing numbers off the top of my head, but like it'd be I a totally it. different deal, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I mean, that's, yeah, it would have been really hard. It would have been impossible really to make it work with, uh, with bank financing. So I love it, Anthony. This is cool. So I I, I want to I want to wrap this up by you know this is this has been a journey for you from you know those early days of knowing I want to get into real estate I want to be I want to be free to doing you know getting over the hump doing some deals you know doing deals creatively with seller financing and other tools as well finally getting to the point where properties went up in value I didn't even mention this in the beginning but you got to the point where you could have enough cash flow coming in to exceed your family's needs so your your wife still does some working in her career but you guys have rental properties that have allowed you to be financially independent and free and one of the things I admire about you and your your personal story is that you're you know you're you're a dad you're hanging out with your kids you're going on boat boat during the summer you're in the northwest and getting outdoors and went hiking last weekend so I, I would just be curious for you like get beyond kind of the numbers and all the details just like 
if, if you wanted to encourage people who are earlier in their journey, like you, you and I are both kind of in that uh, harvester, I call it an ender stage in the book, um, but you're who are not in that stage, but they're kind of in the grind where we have both been. I don't know. Would you have any encouragement for them or what, what would you say to them along the way to, to kind of keep them seeing the light at the end of the tunnel? Yeah, uh, I would. I mean, I would definitely encourage people that are, are looking to uh, follow the similar same or similar paths that you and I have followed um, uh, to keep keep at it. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's not easy, you know, and, and you don't want it to be easy because if it was, then everyone would be doing it and it would be it wouldn't be a thing, you know, uh, and there's a lot that comes out of that, that hardship anyways, like we already discussed, but, um, you know, my words of encouragement, I think, I think one thing I would say is, um, one thing I would say is, is a, there, there aren't any unrealistic goals, uh, but there are unrealistic timelines. And so, you know, it's good, it's good to have timelines attached to goals, but, uh, don't get too attached to them. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's a focal point, but it's not, it's not the end all be all. Uh, sometimes things just take more time than we think they're going to. And sometimes there are things that are out of control that, that cause them to take more time than we think they're going to or want them to, uh, you know, especially, especially when you're young and, and ambitious, right. You, you kind of want everything right then and there. And, you know, and that's natural and that's normal, but, uh, it, it takes some patience. Um, and some stick to itiveness, you know, to get through all those things. Um, what else would I say? I would say, uh, I would say also, um, just try to keep learning, you know, look at it. The one thing that really helped me is, uh, I, I started looking at it as an educational experience, you know, I was investing money in, um, seminars and books and, and coaching, and, uh, I saw that as tuition, you know, like, like people would pay tuition to get a master's degree so that they could become, or, or, or a PhD even, you know, to become a doctor or become, um, you know, whatever, whatever other profession you might go to college or get a degree for. And I, I started, it helped me when I adjusted and started thinking of that time as an educational period. Like I was going back to college, you know, uh, and it was nice that, you know, in this particular college I was attending, I could actually get paid sometimes too, right? Like some of that money would come back. But, but, uh, I think you just have to recognize that there's a period there that's, it's going to be a growth period where you are learning a lot. And, um, sometimes just recognizing where you're actually at and be a real, realistic about that can be really helpful because you realize that uh, you're, you're not going to necessarily be in that harvest phase right away. You're not going to get all the fruit right up front. Um, and you do have to, I don't want to say pay your dues, but you, you just have to, um, you have to mature. It's, it's a profession really, you know, um, becoming an investor, even this type of investor, uh, an active investor is, is a profession that takes a uh, specific skill set, knowledge, um, even, you know, uh, just, just personal growth and, and temperament and those types of things. So, uh, I think that's just all, that's all just, at least for me, that was, that was, uh, that was how my evolution went. And, and, you know, I think there are certainly people out there that will go through similar evolutions if they're serious about getting to a similar, um, similar outcome. Well said, Anthony. Love the advice and appreciate your time. Thank you for sharing the details of, of your early deals, your later deals. You and I get to talk a lot behind the scenes. I didn't mention this earlier, but Anthony and I, with another friend of ours, Joe, have been in a mastermind for how many years now? How many years have we? Been? I don't even know how many years that's been now, but it's, it's, uh, we talk eight, about eight, yeah, eight, eight, or, yeah. eight or eight or maybe more, but it's almost been a decade. And we, we started off talking about real estate all the time. Lately, it's like it's very little about real estate, more about like <laughs> life, right. life and helping each other out. So uh, I would also encourage you to hang out. If, if, if you can find people like Anthony in your life who are amazing people who encourage you, 
find your way, find your way to connect with those people as well. That's been a big help for me in my own journey and an encouragement. And just want to thank you for that, Anthony, and and the friendship and and for just being a, an awesome example and letting me feature you in the book as well. So that was if you haven't read the book, everybody check out the Small and Mighty Real Estate Investor. You can learn more about Anthony's story. I also have a link to the prior uh, interview I did, the written interview with you. And I didn't ask you this, or I'm kind of putting you on the spot, Anthony, but if you have any other place you want people to connect with you if they felt like reaching out, uh, you know, I don't think you're big on like the, you know, social media stuff or anything, but if you have a, a link that I can put in the show notes to people to stay in touch with you, happy to do that as well. Or if you want to tell them right now. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Let me think about that. I don't get that request very often. So yeah, we'll, we'll put something, in, we'll put a link in there that yeah. people can get in touch with me with or whatever. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions or, or, uh, feel any feedback, but uh, but yeah, Chad, man, no, a- any chance I have to, to get with you is always a pleasure and, and an opportunity that I look forward to. So thanks for having me on. Appreciate it, Anthony. See you soon. All right. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that will help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I've not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.